See this? This is a hive city, home to billions of Imperial citizens. Their spires reach into the clouds, while in the underhive below, criminal gangs fight for wealth and power in vast industrial slums. In this video, I'm going to try to capture the epic scale of the underhive on my tabletop by building a massive industrial hive slum. Let's get to it. The inspiration for this project came from this piece of styrofoam that my computer monitor came packed in. Something about these vertical beams and this big circular shape just screamed architecture to me, and I wanted to make something from it. I decided to make it even taller with another piece of packing foam. I don't recall actually what this one is from, but it doesn't matter. I actually started this project a really long time ago, over a year ago actually. This one's a bit thinner than the other, so I'll glue some XPS insulation foam in behind to make it stable and make the bottom a little bit more proud. Cool. So here's the problem with using expanded polystyrene foam, which is what most packing inserts are made from. They're made from a bunch of these little foam particles that are expanded into little foam bubbles, which are then molded with steam into the shapes we get them in. And as you can see, the bubbly texture is still in the material. Now this needs to be covered because it'll make the whole piece look like foam rather than concrete or whatever material we want it to look like. So I'm going to attempt to smooth out the surface by applying polyphyllous spackle to the whole piece. This stuff goes on pink and dries off white and it's just like icing a cake. Afterwards I use a stippling motion with a sponge to hide some of the trowel marks and to give it a coarse texture. In the hard to reach places I ended up just using my hands um, and you know I probably should have worn gloves but Sometimes you start these things not knowing you're going to use your hands, and uh, it's a good idea to always use gloves. Anyways, when everything was dry, the texture is much improved. So it's time to add the focal feature of this wall, a big tunnel running through it. I imagine this would be an exterior or interior dome wall, and this is where an arterial root comes through, making it a bit of a busy intersection. I cut a piece of giant cardboard tube for the tunnel itself, these tubes are used to cast concrete pilings, in case you were wondering, and you can get them at Home Depot. So, using a compass and a pencil, I trace out the hole, cut through it, and fit the tube section in. Next, I cut a bevel on a piece of foam core and lay in the road, squaring off the bottom of the tube and making it navigable. With some insulation foam and the hot wire cutter, I make a broad platform for the road to come out upon, where it can branch into various footpaths up and down the wall. Now I really want this wall to feel like part of something gigantic, and so to imply that, I'm gonna make another very large pipe that enters the wall here. For this one, I used a bit of poster tube, which I covered with brown tape to hide the spiral pattern on the cardboard. To make some big elbows in this huge pipe, I cut a circular piece of foam the same diameter as the tube, then cut it into wedge shapes. I glue these together with construction adhesive. To make the elbow fit the hollow pipe, I made a disc the same size as the inside of the pipe gave the glue a larger area to grab onto. When the whole pipe is ready, I glue it on above the tunnel. At this point, I fill in some of the gaps in the structure with a sensual spackle massage. I make sure to get the cracks around the tunnel as well. With some fingernail stickers and a bit of super glue, I add some nice chunky rivets. Now here, foolishly I might add, I thought I was about halfway done the project, so I decided to start painting. This way, as I added walkways and things, I wouldn't have to reach into every crack and crevice to try to paint the pieces in behind. A smart thing to do would have been to add some grey paint to the spackle in the previous step, which would not only make this painting step unnecessary, it would mean any shallow chips or scratches would show grey underneath. Live and learn. Once again, I used the sponge here, so I didn't have any obvious brush strokes. Time to make some custom walkways. I'm going to use foam core board and then cut a piece of cereal box cardboard the same shape and make a nice frame of about one centimeter. I glue some aluminum mesh down on top, trim around the outside with some kitchen shears, and then glue the cardboard frame down on top, sandwiching the metal bit in between. It feels a bit weird to use the term sandwich because a foam, metal, and cardboard sandwich is quite unappealing but the important bit is that with this method you can make platforms in any size that you set your mind to, as long as you believe in yourself. Next I'm going to take an old water gun, 
which I believe is a Super Soaker 50. The Super Soaker 50. Yep, Super Soaker 50. And I'll take all the screws out of it and rate it for cool looking mechanical pieces. Then with a Dremel tool, I cut off the handle and anything that gives it away as a water gun. I'll glue that in over here on top of a little cardboard to give it some extra stability. And now is the time to start building some of the improvised stairs and structures that I figure the citizens of this environment would build around this junction in an organic way. Now this can be accomplished in several ways. You can build the walls of structures with foam core, like I show here, or you could use blocks of insulation foam to block in shapes. See what I did there? I had these lovely little styrene stairs made from Plastruct, which are my favorite scale stairs for this scale of model. Even the ones made by Games Workshop seem to be way too big and chunky to me, more like amphitheater style seating than a comfortable set of stairs. Seriously, next time you look at a set of stairs, think about how many stairs tall you are. YouTube Analytics tells me that a lot of my audience are short kings, but even still you guys are probably at least six stairs high. But the argument for big stairs seems to be that you can stop a model halfway up, but I prefer to just use short flights with lots of landings. I call this the rookie pilot method. I'm sorry, that's really stupid. Anyways, I kept going around the structure, popping in buildings, platforms, and stairs where I thought they'd be cool. Really, that's the whole criteria here. If it's cool, I go with it. Improvising everything is simultaneously the most fun part about building something like this, but it's also very time consuming. I did a lot of sitting back and thinking, squinting at the project to determine my next move. I wanted it to look busy and lived in, but I didn't want to totally obscure the concrete wall behind, so it was pretty tricky. I used some more cardboard tubes to make some other big thick pipes. By the way, this is not a paper towel tube, which although they were my first crafting materials as a kid, are too flimsy. There are much sturdier tubes inside rolls of aluminum foil and parchment paper, so keep an eye out for those and save them when you got them. If you really like pipes, you can cut a new hole for a pipe, and then you can put a pipe within that pipe. <laughs> Editing can be a powerful tool to disguise the passage of time. Now, did you know that in The Lord of the Rings, over 20 years passes between Bilbo's birthday and when Frodo sets out on his adventure with the ring? Now, the reason I bring this all up is because I started this project a long time ago, back in summer of 2021. And at this point here, I stopped working on this project for over a year, and quite a lot happened in that time. I moved to another country, I had my first child, and I started several other really huge projects on this channel. But the point is, I finished what I started. And for those of you who are wondering about some of those other projects, like for example that 7 foot Imperator Titan that I started, well, it's actually just over there. Oh, yeah, I put it under a cloth. But it's over 8 stairs tall, and an update is coming hot on the heels of this video. So subscribe anyways let's get back to work on this thing something's got bashed around a little bit during the international move so at this point i started reinforcing the foam buildings by using kebab skewers pushing them all the way through the backing styrofoam to add support i should have done this from the beginning to be honest but better late than never i keep adding more and more structures and with them more and more paths up down and across the piece Sometimes creating the sense of something vast is just as much about what you don't show as what you do. In this case, I'm really excited about these paths that go off the piece, either through the concrete wall or off the top, because it gets my imagination going about what could be beyond. It would also make a great entry or exit point during a game. Next, I used some graphics medium chipboard to make some support beams and girders. Now, before the fingers hit the keyboard, you should know that in North America, the term chipboard refers to a thick cardstock like the one you would find at the back of a legal pad. The construction material that you good folks in the UK call chipboard, we refer to as particle board. I don't know what you guys call North American chipboard over there. Maybe crisp board? If anyone knows, please let me know in the comments. With a bunch of these little supports made, I go around the structure propping up some of the jettying buildings, trying not to make things look too regular. I'm trying to strike a balance here where I don't want the buildings to look super planned, but I also don't want them to look like they were made by orcs. Alright, time to make these pink blocks look lived in. No buildings look like a featureless pink block. 
Wait, is that true? Huh. Okay, very few buildings look like a featureless pink block. Let's start by making some interesting doors. I start by cutting some crispy chipboard in one and a half by one inch rectangles. I figured I'd need at least 12. I start by sketching out some designs on the card, then using thin cardboard and other fiddly bits, I make some different door designs. After three, I kind of tapped out. I decided they didn't all need to be unique, and so I used some silicone putty to make a mold, and then some black milliput to cast up some copies. The best part is, I still have the molds for a future project. Nice. To recess the doors and windows, the best method I figured was to just create some facades from foam core and cut the doors and windows directly into them. Now to make windows, I'm going to use some sculptor's mesh glued to chipboard. If you're wondering what the mesh is for, I figured having something blocking the windows is a must-have for a rough neighborhood, and it adds some cool detail as well. Once you've made a sheet of this stuff, you can cut it with kitchen shears, and this saves a lot of individual measuring for windows, and is really handy. You can also use the diamond panes as a guide while you're cutting, so you don't even have to use a ruler or anything to get straight lines. At this stage, I'm going to start detailing the walls of the structures as well. Mostly I'll be using corrugated paper, which at this scale makes some very convincing corrugated metal, a favorite of shanty towns and slums everywhere. Making little oriel windows and facades like this has the added benefit of breaking up the blockiness of some of the buildings and giving them a more interesting shape. I made a real effort to vary the shapes of the windows and add some interesting roof lines where I could as well. I didn't do too many peaked roofs as I want the maximum amount of surfaces to place my little warhams all over. For the most part I'll leave the walkways without railings as they make it harder to reach your hand into the tight spaces and place a mini. And I also like the treacherous drops everywhere. I did put one tiny little barrier here though just because it seemed to fit. I place a few ladders around as well too. Now you can go really crazy at this point adding character and detail to the buildings, building them out and out and out. I try to think about the interior of the building and how somebody would actually use or live in the space inside. Now, sometimes the buildings would probably be pretty cramped and unpleasant in there, but I think that, that kind of makes sense. This one I decided to make with something like a takeout window, on which the metal door has been rolled down because the shop is closed or maybe a gang fight has broken out and the shopkeeper just, you know, knows the drill. In some places this process makes the buildings a fair bit larger, and so this project just kept growing and growing. The absolute hardest part about this project was reining it in so I could actually get it finished, because I could do this forever. So over here on the ground level, I made a little dumpster area that someone could climb up. I also added this little pedestrian walkway into the tunnel, which has the added benefit of adding some more ladders to this upper walkway. Cool. At this stage, any more detail will just make it impossible to paint. So let's get going on adding some color to this beast. I started painting it black using the airbrush, but it was taking a really long time, so I hauled this thing out to the garage and blasted all the unpainted areas with some black spray paint. One of the downfalls of crafting with styrofoam, both EPS and XPS, is that the propellants in most spray paints will eat into the foam and dissolve it if you aren't careful. These propellants do evaporate quickly though, so it's not much of a concern if you're able to keep your distance from the piece with the rattle can. After everything was black, I gave a coat of espresso brown from above to build a nice base for our rusty metal color. Now with all those colors gone, you can really see where the piece is going and it's starting to look so cool. I am though going to bring a lot of these colors back in future steps. But first, I touch up all the concrete areas with some watered down grey craft paint before dry brushing all the metal areas with a dark metallic color. Now before I paint the colors onto these shanty houses, I put some latex masking fluid on a bit of sponge and dabbed it around randomly on the buildings, focusing on the edges. Now I say masking fluid, but my bottle seemed to have dried up and was more like a gummy goop. And I figured that's fine, it'll still work, and it did a little bit, you'll see. With that dried, I started painting the buildings using a variety of bright colors. For some reason shanty towns are often painted in bright cheerful colors, and it adds a great contrast to the rust and grime that we'll apply later. I apply several layers of thin paint, but I'm not too concerned about perfect coverage. These are supposed to look somewhat ramshackle. 
In some places, I didn't even clean my brush between the paints, and the result was some really cool variation in the colors. Happy little accidents. As I went around the piece, I was pretty intentional about which colors went where, giving a lot of thought to which colors would look good next to each other, and how to make the overall piece look balanced as a whole. It's not always the easiest thing to balance chaos and intentionality, and I did a lot of hesitating at this stage, but I always come back to my motto of when in doubt, you can paint over it, and I find I seldom do paint over things. Usually my first instinct is a good one, and it helps to keep that in mind as I craft to keep things moving at a decent speed. Okay, time for the fun part. With a stiff brush, I scrub at the paint and where the masking fluid lies underneath, the paint comes up in very convincing looking chips and flakes. In some places, the effect worked beautifully and in others, well, no paint really came up and it didn't work at all. I blame this definitely on the old bottle of latex masking fluid. So where the masking fluid didn't work out, or in hard to reach areas like corners, I just used some brown paint on a paintbrush, being careful not to overdo it and to make random organic looking patterns. I also used a bit of sponge to get some finer random speckly looking chips. With the chipping done, or crisping as you call it in the UK, I'm going to add a few more bits of detail. Little mechanical bits, more pipes, and a few computer consoles. Now some of these were made using this old chemical factory kit I picked up somewhere, like this boiler type piece, and some of the pipes were made with wooden dowels and bits of card glued around them, while others were made with straws with 3D printed elbow bits. I also painted up a handful of little computers and consoles from various Warhammer kits to make some areas of fine detail and to help tie them in with the setting and scale. I painted these all before putting them on so I wouldn't have to strain myself reaching into the cracks and crevices with a detail brush, and once they were painted, I glued them into place. These pipes here in particular were a real pain to put in, but I think all the details will pay off nicely in the end. As another cool detail, I used a variety of wires to make some power cables that snake from building to building. This is a bit tricky, especially with the stiffer varieties of wire, but the most important thing here is to bend the wire into loops that will look convincingly like a wire that is sagging from gravity. If you get that right, it'll add a really cool sense that these buildings are used and inhabited, but if you get it wrong, it'll look messy and just really bad, to be honest. This big honkin' chubby wire is a garden tie wire. It's wrapped in a nice thick rubber sheath and is really easy to work with, so shout out to Mike from Scratch Bashing for the tip to use those. I painted a nice soba noodle white once it's in place for a bit of contrast. And now for my favorite part. Time to get dirty! Sorry. I used a very simple technique for most of my rust just using burnt sienna oil paint. That's it. See, back in Roman times, the rich reddish soil from Tuscany was used to produce a highly desirable pigment that made a beautiful rusty brown when heated. Now what was in the soil to make this beautiful color? Well, it's iron oxide, also known as rust. So I'm using rust to make rust. And as you can see, it's a pleasure to play around with and dirty things up with it. You can scrub the paint straight on, then feather it and thin it with a bit of mineral spirits, and the streaks can be as bold or subtle as you like. Now the rust looks awesome contrasting with some of these lighter colors, but the orangey red pigment hardly shows up against the red, and at this point I realized that my favorite building, this one up here, was orange and the rust wouldn't show up at all. So on an impulse I repainted the building in hot pink. I recrisped the details with a sponge and paintbrush, skipping the latex step and you can't even really tell. I think it looks way better. As a final step, I designed and printed a few signs to put around the piece. This place here I made into a burger joint called Yummy Burger. My nephew calls all burgers Yummy Burgers and it's really cute, so that one's for him. This place up here, which I thought had kind of a speakeasy nightclub vibe, I called Ripper Jacks. Ripper Jacks are a predatory piece of fauna in Necromunda that basically cling to your face and eat you, starting with the soft bits. They are, however, vaguely shaped like a martini glass, so I leaned into that and made a logo for Ripper Jacks with that design.
Now, having lived in New Jersey, I have a real soft spot for The Sopranos, and so I named this pink building the Bada Boom, after Tony's frequent hangout in The Sopranos. Now, this is a place where adult travelers can come in and enjoy live entertainment, and who knows, maybe in the back rooms, a group of likable but flawed gangsters are polishing their shoes and discussing which skin lotions and moisturizers are the best. I also made a handful of posters to put around. Now one of my pet peeves is when people put little posters on their terrain and the posters are really tilty and crooked. Like in reality, when you put up a poster crookedly, it's like 10 degrees off if you really screw it up. Now if you eyeball putting up a poster and it ends up 45 degrees off, well, you should probably see a doctor. Anyways, I tried to focus on things that you would see around in the future. Some things nice, some things not so nice. And with that, it's done. After a long journey, the piece is complete. I feel like I know this little neighborhood really well now, almost like I grew up there. My favorite thing to do with this piece is to trace the walking paths all the way from one side of the piece to another, and imagine what the journey would be like on foot. Perilous, dangerous, full of adventure, nice. One of the advantages of the piece having so many bold areas of color is that there's lots of little areas all over the piece that can be used as backdrops for taking photos of my miniatures. No matter what the dominant color on a miniature is, there's an area here where it contrasts nicely. This piece can also be used as a gaming board all by itself. The idea is that with just this piece on a small table, you could play a game of Necromunda or Kill Team. One player starts on one corner, the other starts in the opposite corner, or maybe one player starts in the middle and the other player is ambushing them from all sides. I can't wait to try it out. I can also combine this thing with some of my previous builds to make an even more built up hive city and a dense table of terrain. Make sure you're subscribed so you can see what I have in store for this setting and this table. A huge thank you to all my supporters on Patreon. If you guys want to support me on there, there will be a link in the description box below. And you can come join our Discord community where we chat about all sorts of hobby things. Huge thank you to SteelSeries headphones as well. If you guys need any top quality gaming headphones, I'll put a link in the description for them as well. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and we'll see you next time on Eric's Hobby Workshop.